<clears throat> Hello, this is uh, Nathaniel Osgood for the uh, second lecture on aspect-oriented uh, programming. Um, within the uh, first lecture, we had um, introduced uh, some basic notions of aspect-oriented programming, a type of programming designed to try to help modularize things that are otherwise cross-cutting within our programs. Often our programs are divided up into modules um, as delineated by uh, functions and, and um, trees of, of activation called by those functions. One function calls two others, each calling several functions, etc. Might be a tree, might be a DAG. Um, or by uh, classes, um, often also uh, defined uh, to delineate certain sets of, to capture certain sets of functionality. With aspects, we are trying to ca capture these cross-cutting concerns that um, aren't limited to, aren't uh, confined to any one method or, or just a few uh, a call tree of methods, but rather um, are spread throughout a program, spread out throughout many different classes. Examples would be things like logging functionality, which has to go on throughout our our system, or or, or closely related sort of more detailed tracing. Um, might also include things like handling of transactions or things such as uh, security related code. Um, when we have these <coughs> cross-cutting concerns, ladies and gentlemen, um, a traditional uh, uh, functional or class-based decomposition um, doesn't li really leave us with a, uh, a modular solution. If we add a new piece to the program, we have to depend in memory to, uh, to, to put in the appropriate logging messages, et cetera, which can be a challenge, especially when we're in a hurry. By contrast, uh, aspects, um, by introducing um, some basic concepts, uh, join points, these points of significance in a program's execution, and point cuts that specify join points of interest can allow us to weave in code modularly defined, defined in one place, but we've encode to many places in our program. And uh, it can do so in a way using patterns that even when we introduce new pieces to our program, that code of interest will be woven in automatically to those new pieces of our program. So last time we introduced uh, uh, these join points, these points of significance within the, the control flow of our program. We, um, we also introduced um, some notation, kind of a pattern matching notation for point cuts that specify these join points. And um, we introduced this notion of advice that can specify where, before, around, or after these, these, um, uh, these join points, we wish to execute some code. Um, and uh, today's lecture, we're gonna be wrapping up our discussion of point cuts. Um, take a look at a, some examples and how advice can be used. And we'll talk about the, the concept of, of introduction, intertype declarations, where we can introduce static features um, to classes, such as um, introduce um, implementation of certain interfaces, sort of post hoc um, interfaces that aren't originally supported, but which could be there, uh, can support adding functionality that otherwise <laughs> would be missing, say, from a class. And we'll see how aspects can play a role in, in some examples, including for enforcing policy for developers, conventions for developers. Okay, um, so just as a review, we, we handle join points and provide point cuts as ways of specifying them. And I mentioned intertype declarations. We're gonna specify in a little bit more detail than we could last time. Uh, some of the types of point cuts, which I glossed over. And um, and then we're going to talk about um, uh, introduction um, uh, in the form of uh, intertype declarations. So recall that we noted last time that we, uh, we have these join points, these points of significance in terms of doing things with programs, uh, points of, of interest, um, uh, often have, have interest associated with them. Um, interest for accomplishing things at certain key locations. And um, Aspect J provides a way, Aspect J is, a, is an aspect-oriented platform, provides a way of specifying these join points using 
point cuts. So we can specify, um, for example, point cuts associated with calls to a given method, associated with execution of a given function. Here's the call to function, but before we're going into it, we're, we're making a call to it from another context. Here we're, we're actually inside of that function where we get and set fields, ladies and gentlemen, um, and uh, where we have a handler for some exception. Um, when we have some initialization going on, I believe associated with, a, say, an instance of a class. Now, cflow and cflow blow, I didn't really, uh, I glossed over that last time, and, and they're worth noting. So here we have some point cut, and we're talking about things which so this point cut might be um, a call, for example. And we want to know things which are um, uh, occurring, ladies and gentlemen, uh, from, from that point um, until we sort of um, come out of that point. So imagine, say, C flow of a call. So everything that occurs kind of within that call, we're interested in, in say, tracing um, or, or matching some data. C flow flow is very, very similar, except um, while C flow includes the point of interest, say the call to the function, C flow below uh, excludes that particular call, but every includes everything underneath it. Um, this point cut, which can allow us to match an ID or, or, or restrict us to cases where this is of a certain type, but by including an ID, we can can match that ID and sort of unify with it, kind of bind it with information about this. And similarly with target, if we, you know, we might have a, a call to o.foo, which is occurring in a certain context with this being associated with the, the um, reference to the instance whose code is executing o.foo. Target would be o, or calling the target, target in the context of foo would be o. We're calling it um, in that context, and and um, here we have a uh, an ID that can be bound to again get the value of that. Okay, um, I think we'll see an example of that in, in just a minute. Um, and uh, and then we can have static criteria like we're saying um, <coughs> we need to be this code of interest needs to be within some type, maybe a certain class. So the code we're trying to match, the join points we're trying to match lie within some some type. Or um, they're within the code associated with a, with a method or with a constructor. Now having specified these point cuts, we can then with advice um, uh, specify code that should be executed before a point cut, after a point cut, or around it, particularly for the case of for example, the, the the call where we're we're by matching that we can capture the return value, for example, of that call. Okay. Um, okay. So um, let's let's consider some cases here. Um, let's distinguish a call to a method. Note that these uh, point cuts we can combine them with these Boolean operators. So we match one and we're matching the other at the same time, and these form sort of a constraint language to to match these join points in the underlying program. So here we have a something that's that's associated with a call to a method, and it's within the code, ladies and gentlemen, of this method. That suggests a recursive call. Um, note that this call is not, not merely uh, within some code called by this method. It's actually within the code of the method lexically. Um, syntactically and as a result it's a recursive call directly recursive call here um, uh, we're talking about things in the execution of method inside of of method um, uh, that are within the the code of method so this code executing within a call to method which is which is also defined within the um, uh, within the the method function the method itself um, here, ladies and gentlemen, um, we have a, uh, a specification where we're considering things that are that are um, executed um, 
including test.gu itself and, and things beneath it. It's maybe from eclipse.org, these examples. Um, and so it includes test.gu and things that are called by test.gu. If test.gu calls test.foo, which calls test.bar, which calls uh, zap um, outside of test, all of those uh, would be in the, the C flow and could be matched. All right. Um, C flow below would be very similar, but it would not include the, the call itself to test.goo. This is sort of strictly below. Consider a, a call to a method versus a call on something that's not C flow below. So here, um, we're, we're, we're kind of ruling out reentrant things, things where we've called it um, already, and then we encounter it. We've, we've ruled that out. Here, we're not ruling that out. It could be associated with, with uh, re-entrance, okay? Okay, so recall that we have three types of device before, excuse me, after, oh, and around, ladies and gentlemen, around, okay? Um, and, uh, and then code could be woven in uh, at each of those locations, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, notice you can do this for this throwing. Okay, here we're, um, you know, after we're throwing some exception uh, around this point, uh, for example, um, versus after returning, um, after each time it, it completes normally. So there's different routes of exit from move, that, of this point cut move, that we can capture either through regular returning or through exceptions. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, let's consider uh, execution of, of methods or, or in this execution of this method of constructor. Um, here we could be before the constructor um, and you know so we're, we're, we're just before the, uh, the execution of the constructor. Um, we haven't quite initiated it and we could ask about what we're in the constructor, so we could ask about join point static part dot get signature. This will actually get the signature of the the thing that we're in right now, and allow us to say print it out. We could be after the constructor. We could check sort of where we are there. We are. Um, we could be before the the execution of this method. Note it's different from the call to the method. It's at the execution, and we can print that out similarly with after this joint. This join point static part dot get signature provides a way of, of getting the, the signature in whose context we're, we're presently located. Okay, um, let's talk about this binding. You'll recall that um, within our point cuts, we can we can match up these things. These are sort of combinations of point cuts as defined by these sort of operators, right? Or, composing together sets of these things um, in a way that um, that constrains it but also allows us to to do sort of a, a pattern matching okay so um, here for example uh, ladies and gentlemen um, we might have a point cut uh, that that is example call site and here we have a um, we're matching up this um, for um, associated with we, we associate with this variable caller so this will bind caller to whatever this is call e as long as it's also of type object it will bind it to, to target and and this is occurring in the context of some call okay having used that having bound them we could then use it let's take a look at example here um, uh, this one also use arg. So here we define a point cut, um, <coughs> and it's called set x, y, and it has three parameters, figure element, x, and y. Now where do those parameter values come from? Well, they come from binding it sort of in these cases. So first of all, this has to be a call to a um, method, set x, y, which includes these values, right, and, and returns void. It takes two ends and returns for it. So we're going to look for this sort of call. Now, um, when that happens, we're looking for something um, on which this is being called. 
and we're going to bind it to this uh, to this uh, value fe. It is a figure element, we know that, but it's it's going to be bound to this and this type. You'll notice it's again figure e, and then args x y. This is the arguments to the call, um, the particular arguments. So basically, each time we call uh, this figure element dot set x y with particular values, these things can be matched. We'll get the thing on which it's calling for the target, get the values of the arguments, ladies and gentlemen, and those will be bound uh, here. And then those can be used. So this set x y is the name of the of the point cut. That's defined here, and and now we're saying after this point cut, right? Um, um, so after returning from this, we bind these values. So we're matching this point cut, getting kind of the values for fe, x, and y. There's a match, and then those are being used in this code. So we print out fe was moved to this location. x, y, and fe were matched from this case where we we actually call it set x, y, okay? Um, so we can use these uh, point cuts as kind of ways to match things to, to capture. Um, and they can involve some, some pattern matching of sorts where we, uh, well, pattern matching for sure in this, in this context, we match up different calls, but it can also bind values in this sort of way, which can then be used in our advice. So after this sort of call, we can print out this information using this information from the call, from this call to set x, y. <clears throat> okay, um, so for example, we could have this call, we saw uh, this code, we saw this last time with uh, these various calls to uh, display.update, and we can match that code using this display updates point cut. And you notice this matches each of these points. Set P1, set P2, set P3, uh, each of these guys, and set P1 and 2, um, excuse me, uh, set P1 um, uh, and set P2 in line, and, and points uh, X, Y, okay? Now, this is not a very general way. I mean, we could use a, a, uh, a, a pattern like this, which would match things that get newly introduced as well. This is very specific to these, but in general, we could have a pattern, you know, set star. Whenever we have a set star, we'll match that very powerfully. This is very, a uh, bunch of concrete cases. Um, and this point cut identifies a set of joint points in the code where these display updates uh, are occurring, these ones here, these seven of them, okay? So it matches that, and having done that, we could then use this point cut and say, you know, at those points, when we're returning from that, okay, um, when we're returning uh, from from those calls, um, and, and after returning, we're going to do a display update. We're gonna we're gonna update um, this. Now we're gonna call display update. So by so doing. We take this display update out of these things and we put it right here, ladies and gentlemen. And by putting it here, we've modularized it. We've taken it from many scattered places and we put it at one location. And if we were to generalize this with pattern matching, then it could support even automatically weaving this in when we added a new, a new uh, method in one of these that had you know, set, set Z or something. Um, it could automatically match um, match that. So these point cuts um, modularize the logic, the kind of um, the reasoning about where these things go. They specify it in one place and they specify what to do here, rather than scattered willy nilly and or in different places where the the overarching logic of why they live there or what they're doing there is not clear. With point cuts, we can capture the intention better. The fact that these are there because they are associated with sets. Note, however, that there is one case that's not being captured. And that is this case where um, if, if, if we're going to move this thing, if either x, dx is not equal to 0 or dy is not equal to 0, in other words, if they're not both 0, then we need to do a display update and move by. And we're not capturing that here. These are purely static sort of points. 
where we're weaving this in. It's pretty good. We've decreased it, but we, we're not getting this case, ladies and gentlemen. We're not getting, you know, this exact case. To do that, we need a dynamic situation, okay? Um, um, a dynamic situation where we can capture this. And fortunately, <clears throat> in aspect J, we can support that. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, we can have this um, uh, move by site, um, which is a generalization of, um, excuse me, which is going to complement um, uh, those those other ones. And here, you know, we have a call to triangle move by, and it has arguments dx dy. This call, and we're checking make sure dx is not equal to zero or dy is not equal to zero. In other words, they're not both zero. In those cases, we can weave in this code. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're, we're matching this triangle move by, not in a static way. Whatever matches we're gonna do, you know, do these things uh, after it returns. But rather, we're, we're matching it, ladies and gentlemen, in a dynamic way that's, that pays attention to the particular arguments passed, and if those arguments are suitable, that is, we're, we're actually moving at um, some distance x and, and y, we will then um, uh, call this, uh, uh, we'll then do a display update, okay? Um, for, this, uh, for this case, this join point, we'll do a display update. And this includes a dynamic criteria, okay? Um, now, by default aspects, there's sort of one instance of an aspect. Um, which stores one set of data um, for all different uses of the aspect. You can, however, have different instances of the aspect. Aspect is like a, a classic contain um, data that might be specific to, to particular this is, particular sort of cases where it's, it context where it's being used, particular things um, where a certain target is being called or, or for each flow through a certain point in the program we might maintain information in our aspect about that case, in which case we won't want it to be a singleton. Rather, we'll want it to have different copies of this aspect for different values of these things. It can be quite useful. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at, at some, um, some, some uses of aspects. So one anti-pattern that we seek to avoid with aspects, or we can seek to readily avoid with aspects, are cases where we have code that's manually logged here. So we have a, a call here that's now commented out, you know, logging this and logging that, logging that, and, you know, log this message, um, log this message. Those have been manually commented out, ladies and gentlemen, these log messages. Mm. And, you know, putting these in and taking them out takes time. It's error prone. It sometimes we we forget to, to re-enable them when we need them, and um, generally it's a it's a hassle and it leads to cluttered code, lack of clarity, lack of confidence. Sometimes we've we've gotten everything, and it's a big pain. We need to go turn on the logging when we need it, and then turn it off uh, later. And sometimes we're in a hurry to to get things done. Uh, it can be much cleaner to to log with aspects. Um, and one of the reasons is because there's a lot of information that's uh, available automatically um, within our aspect. So for example, we could match, um, uh, have a point cut, which matches uh, all executions of functions. And whenever we're just before that execution, um, we can get the surrounding function. Now this isn't just a call to this or this uh, join point static part uh, get signature if that occurred just before a call it would refer to the, the callee the thing that's calling it here because it's an execution this join point static part dot get signature is referring to the the actual thing being executed and we can get its signature we can get its its name and its parameters uh, return type and then we can log it automatically without having to you know log explicitly where we are this does it automatically for us we put it in this log and this log is maintained by the aspect okay and by default it has um, singleton so just one of them is maintained by the program we could have many if 
if desirable, okay? Um, so this log can end up being used, okay? And um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, notice that this works well with logging being enabled. When logging is enabled, we match and so on. But logging, ladies and gentlemen, isn't always enabled. We don't always want to log. Um, in general, good logging facilities will often throttle that logging based on um, the level that's desired right now, based on dynamic conditions in short. So, um, you know, we could put, um, we're matching all these executions and every time we match it, you know, we, we have such an execution, we can go here, execute this and say, okay, uh, you know, is, uh, is, is logging enabled? If so, we'll log in this way. And once again, the, the good signature information is available here and we can log it. There's a problem with that though, ladies and gentlemen. The problem is that we're doing all this work dynamically. We could instead put this criteria in the uh, point cut and um, in which case we won't even weave in. Here we're weaving this code in with all these executions. Here, if this is not true, we won't even weave this code in, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this code, uh, this code won't, uh, won't in fact get get woven into the um, to the code here, um, and uh, and therefore we don't have to uh, dynamically keep on checking these things. Okay, um, so we can have these if point cuts to cut down the dynamic execution of checking. Is this loggable? Is this loggable? Is this Logable, the finer is a finer grain being logged, is a finer grain being logged, is a finer grain being logged. That can be checked in the um, uh, the point cut itself uh, rather than weaving it in and checking every time we, we undergo an execution. Um, now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we can use uh, aspects in many ways. For example, we might use aspects as a programming mechanism, for example, to check. Um, you know, to handle cases where there's too little um, too little money in the bank account. So we might have, for example, set up an aspect. So um, before we assign to the balance of a bank account with a new value, um, we um, we will. So this is this is setting it with with the new value as kind of the argument. The thing being assigned, we'll check if it's less than a hundred. In which case, we'll. Um, We'll refuse to do it. We'll, we'll throw a illegal argument exception. We shouldn't be assigning it to to that um, low a value. But um, this could be a problem because we may not be uh, handling the case of account termination, case where we're actually setting it to zero because we're closing the account. So um, ladies and gentlemen, here we can basically um, uh, rule out, okay, that we're we're uh, in the midst of executing a a uh, close account uh, close account method and um, in that case um, and so we're not we're not within and C flow within an account termination uh, method uh, and if so then we're warned if we are within an account termination method we won't and put in place this this catch, okay? Um, so if we're not in C flow below or C flow um, associated with account termination, okay. Now I'd like to to describe intertype declarations. Here, the goal is um, rather than to define all these um, join points, we're going to introduce static structure or behavior into classes. So we might introduce a new field into a class. We might introduce a new method into a class, so it has certain values. So we might even have a given class that already exists tell it, okay, it should implement this certain um, interface and if necessary, provide the code. So for example, we could take an existing class point, say, okay, it should implement clonable from, from my system. And and I'm gonna provide the, uh, um, the implementation for this, necessary to do this. Maybe point right now um, uh, does not implement clonable and we're providing the requisite um, method to, to do that, okay? And now as a result, we can clone point to objects, okay? Um, 
because if in our system now point supports clonable following this okay now i want to talk about um one or two final uses of, of aspects here one of the interesting uses as you might imagine for a large code base is to enforce policies enforce conventions across a um, team so here for example we might have a uh, scope um, uh, that says you know it, it, that we're considering things within a certain package but not within something related to test cases not the pattern matching here and here um, we're not within some test case um, but we are within this package um, that's associated with the uh, the scope and then for printing ladies and gentlemen we're looking for cases where someone's calling so we're structurally here um, in the code we're interested in and we're looking for places where people are um, are using values from system.out or system.air or they're having calls to print stack trace and if we see these if we things see things in this scope which are associated with these manual ways of printing we can warn the developer um, please don't print please use the logger instead we can issue a warning message that would clue the developer in to the fact that their code is engaged in risky behavior um, or for example folks um, uh, we're again looking within a certain scope in this simple package and um, we want to consider this is a note that this is a uh, um, uh, in contrast to this guy which used named point cuts here we have a um, um, an anonymous point cut um, for, for these components. We have this named one, but then we have these further criteria, not themselves captured in a named point cut, not captured in something like printing, but, but just here in line. So within, if we're within the scope and, um, and we are um, having a, a call to something that throws an app exception, or we're calling new on a constructor that throws an app exception, um, then we should, then we could say, uh, you know, warn the developer this should not have happened. Warn the developer that this is inappropriate, that we're dealing with this case where, where um, we're calling something that risks throwing some exception, okay? Um, uh, but uh, we might also um, uh, flag cases where app exceptions are being, uh, being handled uh, explicitly, okay? Um, uh, similarly, ladies uh, and gentlemen, uh, if we see a handler for I/O exceptions, um, and within or, or within a certain code, we might say, you know, look, this code shouldn't handle I/O exceptions. If there's design decisions that basically counterindicate handling of these exceptions, um, uh, or or if there's uh, developer convention exceptions that say these things should not be directly handled, or if there's uh, policy enforcement. Um, that's desired for this case where we're um, we shouldn't be handling IO exception we can flag it explicitly now I'll just uh, leave you with uh, some thinking about um, uh, some code to, to capture um, profiling functionality ladies and gentlemen with with aspects so here um, we might for example look at um, um, at a uh, execution of, of some code and uh, within that code um, uh, around that code we might start um, here uh, start recording um, the current time we might then execute that code that's what this return proceed is and then we might record the end time after executing it this is kind of one of these around point cuts we're actually wrapping this stuff around the original code which is captured here but if we're, you know, we're executing some method we we can start <coughs> <coughs> running start recording timing before it proceed with that method and then stop recording timing and then record the time log it away or what have you in our our, our profile uh, related methods and we can automatically of course record where it is where we're executing this is time to execute public methods public methods you can see this public associated with um, with a method we can kind of wrap it up and time it accordingly or if we want to execute um, 
at time points of uh, and the number of times something has been executed. We can capture executions here of methods or of new calls to a, a constructor. And if we're not, and this is often a, a key, key need, ladies and gentlemen, if we're not itself in one of these aspects, which might be something we'd want to enforce too, if we're not, um, um, if we're not uh, around some, some particular aspects, because um, uh, we don't want to be counting the executions of, of the things in this aspect, then just before it, we get join point signature, and we basically, for that method, <coughs> using say a hash map for this method, we, we get a, a count of previous times and we increment it, right? So um, we, can, um, we can increment the um, uh, associate value. Um, so rather than um, calling it uh, just depending on um, a, a profiler, we can actually, uh, uh, excuse me, we can actually um, uh, spot executions of this code uh, we can look up how many times we've executed it, increment that, store it away, etc. Uh, for heap size, we can look for calls to allocate that are not itself within here. We can get um, the uh, declaring type associated with it, and um, if it's an array, compute its size, otherwise iterate and, and sum up the sizes um, in order to figure out how much was, was allocated here. And we could record that as associated with this uh, type or, or with this um, um, or with the place where this is occurring, the, the context where this is uh, occurring. Okay. Um, okay. So um, the context where, where this is, is going on, this allocation, um, we could do some more work to get a, a um, caller for that. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. Um, Appreciate your patience with this. I uh, hope this information has been helpful in, in um, aiding your understanding of aspect-oriented programming.